For a better sense of how these pivotal talks could turn out, let me turn to Andrew Dortz, Director of International Government Relations at the Nature Conservancy. Andrew, welcome. Thank you. Uh, let me begin with something that Nathan, our correspondent, said in his piece. He said there are 30 core questions that remain, 1,500 points of disagreement in the draft treaty. Does that surprise you? No. We saw, I was in Bonn a few weeks ago for the negotiations, and what's happened is there's a negotiating text on the table with many, many different opportunities and options in it. That'll get streamlined pretty quickly down to a core set of elements to be negotiated over the two weeks of Paris coming up. At this point, do the disagreements seem too wide to reach any kind of consensus? Let me tell you a little joke about it as, as a former negotiator myself, is that the negotiators will fill the space provided for them. So if we allow them two weeks, there's enough time to get to an agreement on the core issues and actually come out of Paris with a successful agreement to help keep the world on a trajectory to stay below two degrees of total warming. So how do you define a successful summit? Well, there are a couple of things we need. First, we need a set of ambitious emissions reduction commitments. Unfortunately, those are already on the table. We know how much the world is committed to. And there are now 150 countries that have made commitments to reduce emissions. But those aren't going to be enough to keep the world safe and deal with climate change. So the next key thing we really need in the agreement is for a process for countries to come back to the table every five years or so and ratchet up those commitments over time until we actually can solve the problem. So you're saying basically actions here speak louder than words. Make the commitments, follow through, and meet every couple of years. Right. We're actually seeing a transition now in how the international community is dealing with climate change. Compare this to the Kyoto Protocol. And it's been 18 years since the world adopted a treaty on climate change. In the old model, the countries would agree on an emissions reduction commitment or a target, and then go home and try and figure out how to implement that. That was a top-down approach. This time around, we have a bottom-up approach, where countries have already made their commitments to what they think they can implement at home and put in place those, those policies and measures at home, and then tell the international community, this is our best pledge. Now we'll keep coming back and review those pledges and keep ratcheting them up over time. So it's a, it's a process different than it was in Kyoto, but that didn't work out so well. So hopefully mm -hmm. this new process is actually going to get us to where we need to be. Andrew, what about money? Money talks, and a lot of these developing countries want help from the richer countries, are they going to get it? And how much of an obstacle these, is this going to be? These countries want help, and they need help. Several years ago in Copenhagen, the developed countries committed to put about $100 billion a year on the table by 2020 to help developing countries. And everyone knew at the time even that wasn't going to be enough. The latest estimate is that today, in 2014, countries have given, are giving about $62 billion a year. So we're scaling up to that commitment of $100 billion by 2020. That's not going to be enough. So one of the questions for Paris is, can developed countries commit more? One of the exciting things, though, is it's not just the developed countries anymore. China has now become a climate donor. And when President Xi was in Washington a few weeks ago, he committed to about $3 billion a year, or $3 billion in climate aid. But even more important than that, it's not just the hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign aid to developing countries that are going to solve the problem. The real challenge is the trillions of dollars of investment and infrastructure and energy that the private sector is going to move in the, in the next several decades that are going to solve the problem. And you brought up China, and I want to put up a full screen or graphics that we have to really show China's commitment as the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. President Xi has really made this a uh, big commitment, working to reach its emission peak before a 2030 deadline, reducing its carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP by 60 to 65 percent by 2030 from 2005 levels, increasing the share of non-fossil fuels in its primary energy consumption to about 20 percent by 2030, and as you mentioned, pledging $3 billion to help developing countries combat climate change. These are pretty remarkable. There are two reasons why I'm really optimistic that the world is going to hopefully turn the corner towards a low carbon future in Paris, and they both have to deal with China. Number one is that in Copenhagen several years ago, the Ch China and the US were at odds about how to solve the world's climate problem. Today, cooperation on climate change is absolutely central to the bilateral relationship between China at sense the level of, of the president. There. There's a sense of unity that the two biggest carbon emitters and the two largest economies are actually leading. The other reason I'm really excited is that China has these new targets, and we're starting to see the private sector respond. So within the last few weeks, a number of major banks have made big commitments, about hundreds of billions of dollars, that they're going to make available for investment in renewable energy. They're not doing that to be nice guys. They're doing that because they see market opportunities in China that's being driven by the policy framework emerging in China's five-year plan. So policy is working, and investment is following.
Andrew Deutz, I hope you come back and talk to us once the conference gets underway. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.